what's the emotional intelligence right now of the country? Well, I think people are suffering actually quite a bit. They have less tolerance for novelty, for uncertainty, and for complexity. And so they gravitate to simple, single causes or a single savior. And that is the harbinger of authoritarianism. Welcome back to The Empire's New Clothes. This is the show where we discuss the forces that make and break empires. I'm your host, Bradford MacArthur. We're about to speak with Lisa Feldman Barrett. She's a distinguished professor at Northeastern University. She's also one of the top 1% of most cited scientists. Today, we're gonna ask her, what's the emotional intelligence of America? She's gonna break down for us emotions, identity, and what all these things mean in the nation we live in today. Welcome, Lisa. Good to have you on the show. Happy to be with you. Yeah, wonderful. So we spend a lot of time here looking at the cyclicality of empire and what what makes empire, what breaks empire, and all the different forces involved. Mm-hmm. And so you are an expert on emotions. You've spent years studying emotions, how are they built, how are they constructed. And so perhaps walk us through a little bit of your background and some of your experiences there? Sure. Well, uh, I'm a psychologist by training. I have a PhD in psychology and uh, I've retrained in uh, physiology and neuroscience. And, um, you know, I uh, have some experience working with engineers and computer scientists. So I'm a person who you know, knows a little bit about a lot of things, maybe you could say. Um, I'm also chief science officer for the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So that means I also know a little bit about the law. Um, and that uh, the goal of that um, center, which is a really important center actually, is to educate judges and uh, lawyers and other legal actors on the best use of science and in particular neuroscience and behavioral science in the courtroom. Hmm. Um, Interesting. And, um, you know, I'm really uh, what you would call, uh, a, a, you know, a lab scientist in the sense that I'm not a bench scientist. We don't have benches in psychology. You know, we have big brain scanning machines. But um, uh, and then I would say maybe Five or six years ago, I was persuaded to do something that I swore that I would never do, which was to write uh, <laughs> about science for the public. Um, but I was persuaded to do it um, in part because I think uh, it's really needed. Um, you can't really be a citizen in uh, informed and in citizen in the, in the United States and have your vote count in a meaningful way if you don't understand the basics of how science works and what science tells us about the big challenges of our of our time. And so I felt like, well, if I have a little bit to contribute there, you know, then I should. So uh, that's something also that I try to do. Interesting. Well, yeah, that's that's brave to do that anytime, but especially now when we're we're just so hungry for science based fact <laughs> these days. <laughs> Uh, of course, I'm being a bit facetious because we'll circle back to that, but I think a lot of your work actually really talks about the intersection of fact and what we perceive as true. Absolutely. And I mean, certainly when it comes to emotion, um, you know, emotion might mm-hmm. not seem as important as something like climate change or, um, you know, some of the really sort of big issues that, are, that we're grappling with, big existential um, kinds of threats. But actually, understanding something about how your brain works, how your brain sort of continually talks to your body and the other brains and bodies all around you um, is really fundamentally important for physical health and not just disease burden for individual people, not just suffering uh, for individual people, but actually the fiscal health of the country and the financial burden um, that um, health and illness place on the country as a whole, right? So um, that, you know, ha- turns out to be seriously important. So 
understanding something about how your brain works and emotion is just a really good lens on that larger issue turns out to be really important for even for public policy and um uh, you know, like these, like I said, these bigger policy um, issues that that people are are currently grappling with. Yeah, I want I want to get into that. Uh, let's let's start super broad, and I so I will ask you to analyze the emotional intelligence of America, and that might sound crazy, and maybe it is, but let's let let's try to dive into that a little bit. Yeah. So typically, the way that people talk about or scientists talk about emotional intelligence or, or that in the public uh, journalists write about it, picks up on themes of like, how well uh, do you regulate your own emotions? Um, how well do you recognize mm. emotions in other people? Um, but I, I wrote an article um, in Nautilus magazine a, a couple of years ago in relation to a book that I published, a, a popular science book called How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. And in that article and in the book I really talk about how emotional intelligence is is really more about how flexibly can you make sense of what is going on inside your own body basically in relation to what's going on around you in the world and so to answer your question about emotional intelligence I just want to take one step back and say you mm -hmm. know human brains are really expensive organs they're they're about 20% of your metabolic budget goes to running your, that, you know, three pound blob of meat between your ears. That is pricey. It, it is pricey. Yeah. It's the most expensive one, uh, most expensive organ that you have. So why do we even have a brain? And the answer is because you've got a really complicated body. You know, animals that had mm. pretty small and um, unsophisticated bodies, you know, back 550 million years ago, and even today, don't have brains because they don't really need them. Um, but we need a brain because we have a really complicated body. And actually, the internal systems of our bodies, our lungs, our, our heart, our, you know, our immune system, this adaptive immune system that we have that learns um, you know, by exposure to pathogens and so on, the, these systems actually evolved at the same time as the brain evolved, as our brains evolved. Um, hmm. And if you look at the anatomy of the brain, what this tells you is that, and you understand something about the energetic cost of the brain, what you realize is your brain's most important job is not rationality. It's not thinking. Um, it's uh, regulating your body, regulating the systems of your body in a, in a metabolically efficient way. Hmm. Um, and that may sound really boring, but that actually is what your brain is doing. Right now, we're having a conversation and we're talking about big ideas. But as we are doing this, the exact same parts of our brain that allow us to talk and to, to listen to each other and understand, use and understand words and think great thoughts is, are actually the same parts that are regulating you know, our heart, our lungs, <clears throat> our immune system, and so on right now. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And so, I always thought I was bad at multitasking, but you <laughs> totally proved me wrong. Yeah, just now. well, we're always multitasking, actually. And, you know. Yeah, it's a wonderful way to I, think I about it. I will say that um, one thing that's really clear is that what allows us to multitask so efficiently all the time, it's not just pregnant women who are multitasking, right? <laughs> they certainly have a big task, yeah. but <laughs> we're multitasking all the time, too. And what allows us to do it is that we're largely ignorant of this entire drama that's going on inside our own bodies. Um, we're largely unaware of it. And we're unaware of it hmm. because we're not really wired to experience it in very high dimensional detail, like vision. You know, you look around and you see very high dimensional detail, like a, like a high dimensional television. Well, you know, your ability to be aware of what's going on inside your own body is more like 1950s black and white TV with a bad antenna in a rainstorm. I mean, like you did, we're not really wired to have really precise um, sensations. And if you do, I, I feel really, you have my great empathy because then you will be paying attention to nothing going on around you in the world. I mean, you really, when your body starts to scream at your brain, 
you are no longer multitasking, my friend. You, you're just, you, you know, your world shrinks to your body. And the thing is that evolution fashioned us with this way of experiencing what's going on in our bodies, not as these high, precise, high dimensional, precise sensations, but as these simple feelings that are always with us, feeling pleasant, feeling unpleasant, feeling worked up, feeling calm, feeling comfortable, feeling uncomfortable. These are not emotions. These are the simple feelings that come from your brain managing your body. So sometimes when I talk about this, I use an analogy of a budget, you know, like your brain is running a budget mm. for your body and it's not budgeting money. It's budgeting glucose and water and salt and oxygen mm. and all the things that, um, you know, your cells need to stay alive and, and to keep functioning. And your brain has to budget. It has to make decisions about expenditures based on the expected gains or rewards or investments, right? And that's what your brain's doing all the time. So when your body budget is, you know, balanced, you feel good. And when you're running a deficit, for lots of reasons you could run a deficit, you don't feel so good. Mm -hmm. You start to feel unpleasant and distressed. And if you're really uh, running a deficit, you will start to suffer. And, you know, you can think about depression as a bankrupt body budget, in a sense. Um, and so the point that I'm trying to make here is that the human brain constantly is looking to make sense of what's going on in the body outside of your awareness, your brain is doing this, in relation to what's going on around you in the world. So when you feel like shit, because your body budget is maybe you're not sleeping enough, maybe uh, you aren't eating healthfully, maybe you're not exercising, um, which is like an investment in a healthy brain, you know, and body, because you mm -hmm. expect to get, you know, interest on that investment as long as you replenish what you spend. Um, if you are socially isolated, if you, I don't know, live in a country where there's incredible strife, where there's casual brutality, people speak to each other in ways that are just profoundly, um, not just disrespectful sometimes, but, you know, um, uh, really um, designed to um, humiliate, uh, and cause pain mm. um, if yeah. you live in a country and I'm not speaking here of, of liberals or, or, or conservatives but the dramatic shifts in political um, landscape makes that means always some group of people are feeling alienated from the values that are being enacted around them and all of these things um, take a toll on a body budget so Mm -hmm. What I want to say is that, and then, you know, you feel unpleasant and so your brain tries to make sense of that by, by you know, by creating exactly. anger or sadness or fear. And we can talk about how the brain does that, but my point is that how, what's the emotional intelligence right now of the country? Well, I think people are suffering actually quite a bit. And there are lots of things that can make little withdrawals on your body budget um, and make your budget run a little less efficiently than it should, which adds a little metabolic tax. And that, you know, each time it happens that you read something in the paper or you listen to two politicians talk to each other without any semblance of human dignity or, or you know, just, you know, each time it just, it just costs you a little bit. Not very much, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even um, even water, if it continues to drip on a solid steel pipe, will eventually bore a hole through that pipe if it continues over time, right? So, the, I guess what I would say is, um, I think everybody's trying to do the best they can. Uh, I think everybody mm -hmm. is suffering. 
um, to some extent, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people are suffering. The World Health Organization just promoted depression to outstrip now heart disease as the major disease burden in the world. Wow. And depression is a disorder of metabolism. It's a disorder of energy regulation. It's, it is a mood disorder because these simple feelings that come from body budgeting are what you would call mood. I would call them affect with an A. They're not emotions. They are properties of consciousness that are with you all the time. And sometimes your brain will make sense of them as emotions. But that's not obligatory. That's just something our brains do automatically because we've been taught to do it. So I think that um, I think that people are suffering, and the suffering didn't start with COVID. You know, um, the 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 years preceding um, COVID were, I think, historians will, an epidemiologist will look back at this time as a major public health crisis, N not just COVID, but even before, because we've created an environment for ourselves that if I had to pick a bunch of things that are really bad for a human nervous system and put them all together, it would be, you know, and I, I don't mean to sound really bleak because I think there are really hopeful signs and people are really, you know, amidst all of this suffering there, you've, you know, mm -hmm. there are people who are trying to be their best selves, who are trying to help other people, who are looking for ways to protect their kids or, you know, take care of their parents or, you know, try to manage their own body budgets better. Um, you know, my book and um, the new book that I published, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, um, the, I mean, are selling incredibly well. I mean, How Emotions Are Made was published for years ago and it's still selling very strongly in many countries around the world um and the new book you know was published right at the height of the covid pandemic and you know did actually really well compared to all the other books that are new books that are languishing um and why is that it's because people want to use science to improve their lives and the lives of their peeps you know and so that tells me that um, I think the emotional intelligence um, of uh, the country, you know, if you were taking a general temperature, is it's not dire, um, but people need information um, mm -hmm. it, that isn't just pop psychology or what, you know, uh, David Linden, yeah. the neuroscientist, would call neuro bullshit. You know, they need actual, <laughs> actual, you know, um, I mean, scientists don't like to use the F word, fact. That's a really scary word for a uh -huh. scientist, right? So, you know, uh -huh. but findings maybe is be are better, you know, like scientific findings. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, science and philosophy. Everyone else is comfortable with the yes, F Yes, they word. are. Um, you know, science and, and philosophy are like tools for living. And so I think Americans are kind of, you know, they're, they're really grappling. They're really searching. That's why um, yeah. it's important that we dispel scientific myths and we give people tools that, um, that you know, the evidence suggests work and that we set expectations realistically right about what these mm -hmm. tools can actually do and what they can't yeah and when you mentioned overlaying your your findings of how the body is multitasking and there's the body budget and we're also at the same time taking information from the outside i thought that was an extremely wonderful metaphor for the u.s or any nation you're constantly working with and figuring out what's going on internally domestically and yeah. then how are we working as a nation externally through our for foreign policy or whatever? And even going further on that, I thought that was so perfect for the U.S. because we tend to be, our, our fidelity of knowledge and interaction with the outside world is super high definition. 
we're we're in all the other countries, or at least traditionally, that's us. We're outward focused. We are that global empire, not from a controlling a land perspective, but from economics and a power perspective. But then internally, we have all these super different groups of people with different feelings and thoughts and beliefs where we're becoming more more morally entrenched in different camps. And that makes a lot of sense when you say it like that, especially because I, I, I look at a nation and, and it, I, I don't see that high fidelity of understanding. But, but like you said, that we, we do recognize, we, we feel something is off. We desperately feel something is off. And we're searching and we're, we're trying to figure that out and work through it. And who knows where we'll end up, but that's the journey we're on right now. Yeah, yeah, and, it's a good analogy. Oh, the the go analogy ahead. that you're crafting is really good because um, because you know you you have a cardiovascular system and you have a respiratory system and you have a gut, you know, a GI system and you have all these systems, but you know what happens if they don't talk to each other? Yeah, it gets bad. You quick. die, basically. Exactly. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, and so when things are not coordinated or when, when body budgeting is off, there's distress. You feel it as distress, really. You have to really teach yourself. You can teach yourself to experience it as discomfort and not as suffering. This is also something I talk about in um, how emotions are made. And um, it's, you know, people who are interested in mindfulness and Buddhist philosophy, contemplative philosophy, find it very useful. But really, it's just neuroscience, actually. Um, uh, but there also is a lesson there, maybe, to follow up on your analogy, you know, for for what, a, what we should be doing in our country to, um, to, to ease everybody's pain. Yeah, well... And I'd like to look at, so taking those concepts of something's off with America, we've, we've recognized that, and Americans recognize that, but we're, we're not quite sure where to, you know, where, where are things off? Is it the gut? Is it the lungs? Is it everything? Are they all miscommunicating? And then overlay that with our identity of American exceptionalism and these these profound ideas that we've built a nation on. And so on one hand, if a nation is stumbling and having all these internal problems, yet the root of identity is in these ideas of uh, some kind of dominance or I don't want to use the word superiority, but this idea that there's this exceptionalism in this group of people and we have this uh, idea of progress that things are going to keep getting better and better and better and better. So on one hand, reality feels very different from that. But on the other hand, these ideas are somewhat like we hold on even harder because there's hope there of, well, things will get better. I just need to... Do, do you feel this tension at all in America? And, and how, how do these identities that we've created through the process that you see emotion being constructed, are these identities just constructs we just need to give them up because they're not helpful anymore? Or how does that work with the the nation that we're currently have in front of us today? So there are a lot of questions embedded in in what appeared to be one question from you. There are a lot of questions actually there. Um, <laughs> yes. And so let's try to pick them apart a little bit one at a time. So the first thing to understand is that everything that you experience and everything that you do is constructed by your brain. Not only by your brain, right? You're not like a brain in a vat. Your brain is constantly talking to your body and it's constantly Talk, basically taking in information from the world and in and acting on the world so there's a conversation there too and much of the world it are other people other brains and bodies and and so that's important to understand so your brain detects nothing about the world you don't detect anything your brain computes so for example you know mm. When you see color, when you see an object with lines and, you know, edges and color, 
you're not detecting those things. Your brain is actually computing them based on a combination of what is in your head from memory and the sense data that comes from your retina. Because you don't have access to the entire light spectrum in the universe. You can only take in what's coming in from your retina. And this is a really important point, mm -hmm. right? If you look at something and you take information in from your retina and you don't have prior knowledge of how to make sense of that, of those sense data, you will be experientially blind to what you are looking at. You'll just see noise, basically. So like when you hear a language that you can't understand, you're not fluent in that language, it just sounds like sounds to you that don't have, that make no sense. That's experiential blindness. And um, uh, there are, it's really easy to demonstrate this when I'm giving talks to people, I sometimes will demonstrate experiential blindness with vision um, and then cure people of that blindness. And then all of a sudden they see something, an object in a you know, bunch of black and white blobs that they've never seen before. And now we'll never unsee, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the first thing to realize is, is that everything is constructed, including features of identity. And this is something that um, uh, I talk about in, in both books, actually. Um, you know, Seven and a Half Lessons is a really... Um, it's not a typical popular science book. It's a, a book of little essays that are meant to be very huh. accessible and readable. I mean, in a you know each essay will take less than an hour, really. Um, you know, about thirty minutes. Um, yeah. But you know, and and maybe there's a little humor in it and a little sarcasm. But the idea it's trying to raise big questions like the ones you're asking, and. And those are the, that's what lingers with you over time, actually, is not, um, you know, the book itself is very short, but, uh, but there's a lot packed in there, um, and it's really meant for people who wouldn't normally pick up a popular science book. You know, unlike, let's say, How Emotions Are Made, which is a pretty standard popular science book. You know, it's 300 pages, it's got lots of references, and, and so on and so forth. Mm hmm and issues about identity and explaining how it is that your brain computes your identity and how do identities take hold and how do they form and how do they take shape and how can you change them? Um, uh, if, you know, how does that work is really in both books, but there's a little, you know, the sketch really is in how is in um, seven and a half lessons. And I think the important thing to understand is that, um, Nobody has a single identity. You have features of identity, right? So just in the same way that when you experience visually the world, there are features that you experience, colors, brightness, you know, light, dark. So there, there are all these features that you experience. With your identity, you also have features that your brain is computing. Um, and those are... So, you know, I'm a woman and I'm also a wife and I'm a mother and I'm a professor. I'm a scientist. I, um, you know, uh, I'm a baker. I'm a gardener. I, I have lots of dimensions to my identity. Um, and so you aren't one thing, one static thing. The features of your identity that your brain computes is pretty much influenced by the context that you're in. Um, it's not, you know, it's not random and it's not like an unlimited number of features, but there's always more than one. And that's important because that's a, actually a form of um, resilience, if you will, that the more identity features that you can learn to cultivate for yourself, if you can architect your life in a way to broaden the number of features of your identity, that will actually serve as a source of resilience for you um, uh, when there is body budgeting, when there are body budgeting issues. Um, I think it's also important to remember that um, that the features don't always, they're not always consistent with each other. So I remember the last time that I visited Israel which was a number of years ago. And 
The thing I found really surprising that was very different from the U.S. is that when you talk to people about one issue, so one aspect of their identity, you can't really predict what that will mean for other issues, what, what their opinion will be or how, what their actions will be on other issues. They don't line up into two simple groups or even three simple groups. Yeah. In the United States, if you know somebody's opinion about abortion and uh, gun control, you can pretty much, not completely, but you can guess reasonably well uh, what their opinion is on other um, features or uh, other issues, uh, um, you know, other features of their identity, what their actions or beliefs will be about other issues. And that's not, I mean, that's really not healthy, actually. That's actually makes people... It's kind of the opposite of what Yeah, exactly. It really, it doesn't allow for the kind of resilience, the kind of flexibility that you need in how you think about yourself and how you and and the actions that you take that will keep you flexible, um, which is the key to resilience in difficult circumstances. So, so the fir- that's the first thing I want to say. Basically, is that we're not you're not one person, you're not one self. Y- you have lots of different aspects to yourself, and sometimes they're contradictory, and that's normal. Um, I think the second thing is that. Um, to understand is that exceptionalism, and I want to be really clear here, okay, exceptionalism in and of itself, that is your belief that you can do exceptional things, is not bad. What's potentially harmful is when that exceptionalism comes at the expense of somebody else. That isn't necessary. It's just how things are set up. So the problem really isn't that in the US people are overly optimistic about their capacities and their abilities. Like I often tell people, people say to me, how do you get done so much in a day? Like you, you know, I, uh, I get a lot done apparently. So uh, to me, it feels like I never get enough done, you know, but I get, I get a lot done. How do I get right. a lot done? And the answer is I'm unrealistically optimistic about how much I can get done. So I never get done as much as I want to, but I always probably get done more than I would if I wasn't unrealistically optimistic. But that optimism does not come at the expense of another human being, as far as I know, to my, the best of my ability. I don't think it does, or at least I try really hard to make sure that's mm-hmm. the case. And I, what I try to do is not just float my own boat, but float other people's boats as well. And not just the people who look like me, right? Or who have the same beliefs as me. And I think that's really the issue here. What's really the issue to me is humans have a great capacity to categorize. They see similarities and they make a category and they draw a boundary. So you draw a line in the sand and it becomes a country. And then you have, you know, citizens and immigrants. Um, you know, our brains draw lines on the vis- visible light spectrum. You know, we have, there are wavelengths of light that we can see, and our brain divides them up into categories. We basically, it's like drawing lines. Well, this is red, and this is blue, and this is purple, and this is green, and so on and so forth. But there's nothing in, there's nothing really, um, and different, different cultures do it, draw the lines differently. All it really requires is that a group of people agree where the line is, and then the line becomes real. Um, And then we also do it with each other. We find a feature like skin color, skin tone, or the presence of breasts and a vagina versus a penis, or take your pick. It could be, you know, blonde hair and dark hair. It could be the length of your toenails. It actually could be any feature. But once a bunch of humans agree to draw a boundary, then they, then exceptionalism becomes problematic because um, 
Mm-hmm. It, it applies to only the people who are like you on those features. And um, and the ones who are not like you, the sort of, the, who aren't us, but who are them, um, can be disadvantaged by your actions. So if you look at, um, you know, a lot of the research on discrimination and prejudice, what you see is that, sure, there are some people who will deliberately go out of their way to harm somebody in a category that isn't theirs, right? So the out group, somebody who's not like them in some way. Um, But um, usually it's that they're favoring a member of the in group and that will disadvantage somebody from the out group. And if you already start with a distributional difference in power and wealth to begin with, you know, that's, that, those really are the seeds of, of um, discrimination and, and prejudice. So I guess my point to you is that, you know, you and I could be in separate groups. I'm a woman and I'm a cis woman and you're, I'm imagining a cis man. So that would put us in different groups. But we could be in the same group because we both speak English and we both are melanin challenged, right? We're both light skinned. Um, We could be in different groups because I was born in Canada and you were born, where were you born? Okay. Ah, and so there's another. We could be in different groups because, um, you know, I live in the north and I was born in the north and you were born in the south. Um, Mm -hmm. Or we could be in the same group because... You know, uh, I don't know. Do you like pizza? Uh, usually in the morning when it's okay. cold. Well, okay. So I prefer pizza, you know, at night for dinner when it's warm. But my point is, so you know, we could we <laughs> we could be in the same group called, of pizza lovers, or um, we could um, be in different groups for what you know whether we consider it breakfast or dinner. And you might say, or listeners might say, mm-hmm. well, all of that's really trivial. But actually, it's not trivial. It's exactly the same. Skin color evolved based on the tug of war between two vitamins in relation to where you live uh, relative to UV light and the equator. That's it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't actually have any other meaning other than that. But we have created a whole, um, what I call social reality of meaning um, by imposing functions on features that they were never meant to serve, like skin color. So skin tone now is symbolic and it stands in for a whole bunch of other things that it wasn't actually, didn't evolve to stand in for. And if you think that that is miraculous, you're right, because it's what we do with money. I mean, what is money? What are little pieces of paper? How do they get value? They get value because a group of people agree that little pieces of paper can be traded for material goods and then poof, they can. And if some people withdraw their consent, then they aren't worth anything. That's what happened in the mortgage crisis, right? Mortgages were worth something and then they weren't. And if you look throughout the course of human history, salt, barley, rocks, shells, lots of things serve as currency All that's required is that a group of people are willing to trade them for material goods. It's only by consent. And it's not even conscious consent. You don't walk around thinking, hmm, I'm going to agree that this little piece of paper is worth some, you know, has a value and can be traded for something else. No, you just do it. I give it to you. You give me the goods. And that is the, that is our, you know, our, our consent, our agreement. And it's exactly the same thing with the categories for race and for Democrat and Republican, um, for liberal and conservative, um, for every kind of category. You know, even biological sex isn't as clear as uh, you might imagine. So the, the, li- the, the lines are not as clearly drawn. And sometimes physicians draw them where they aren't clearly drawn. Mm-hmm. So I guess my point to you is I don't really know that exceptionalism on its own, meaning believe that you are great, is a problem. Believing that you are better than other people, however, if that's the definition of exceptionalism, then 
Yes, I would say that's a problem. I would say it's a problem. And it's a problem that creeps up and bites you in the ass when you're not looking. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Well, uh, I think that's wonderful. And I want to flesh this out a little more in the category of fake news and this type of, uh, perhaps you could say, a post truth culture we're living in. And I loved what you were saying about consent because a lot of us have consented to the idea that. Um, I'll just throw some phrases, do what feels right, find your own truth, these types of things is kind of our, our modern culture of truth making. Not for everyone, but it's there's definitely a, a growing contingent. And so perhaps some people are beginning to understand how this framework encourages things like fake news, because if you can create your own personal truth, you can have your own conspiracy or believe whatever you want to. And so it's interesting how in one way, we're saying, oh, this is like a great way to be, but then going around and flipping it and say, well, I, I disagree with that version, um, which is not unlike what you're saying about the other stuff is we're consenting to these things, but not everyone's consenting to that. And, and so ultimately, if, if that's the framework, this idea of create your own truth, it's rooting truth-making in emotion and feeling instead of findings and facts. And so, based on your research, what, what would it have to say about this, this modern way that we're um, changing the way that we're framing the society around yeah, us? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So, uh, I would say that, um, you know, when you feel very strongly about something, um, and, you know, you, your brain certainly could construct an emotion around it, but it's usually affect that you're feeling. It's not emotion necessarily. Mm. Um, so, you know, emotion is just the, is just um, additional meaning making that your brain gives to affect, really, in certain case, in certain instances. But when you feel really strongly about something, you believe it's true. Mm -hmm. The thing is that it doesn't guarantee that it's true. It just means that you believe it and you feel really strongly about it. Um, so... It also doesn't guarantee it's not. Well, in certain cases it does, it's, actually. There, in certain cases, the, the, it doesn't matter how strongly you believe something, it, you're, you're wrong. I was trying to give benefit of doubt to well, somebody. but look, you know, you can strongly believe that COVID is not a threat. The COVID virus is not a threat. You can strongly, strongly, strongly believe it. But the virus really doesn't care what you believe. It only cares that you have a nice, wet set of lungs. So, you know, when we talk about... You know, it's funny for a person who does work in the construction of reality and um, social mm -hmm. reality and, um, you know, to talk to you about there are some facts that really are facts. Um, you know, but what I'll say is um, social reality is conditioned on physical reality and without waxing you know, philosophical about quantum mechanics, I will say, um, you and I could agree that we could walk through a wall, but that won't make it true. You and I can agree that we could um, jump off a roof and fly, uh, but that won't make it true. You and I could agree that, uh, lots of people could agree that they could eat glass for a food, and that will make it true. It's really not the same as deciding that pizza is good for breakfast or for dinner. There's a physical reality there mm -hmm. that it doesn't really matter what you believe. You can believe that you can say anything you want to anybody and it won't affect them in a bad way or in a good way. But you will be wrong. It doesn't, their nervous system doesn't care what you believe. You know? So in this country, we prize individual rights and freedoms. But the biological reality is that we are, we have socially dependent nervous systems. We make, metaphorically speaking, and sometimes not just metaphorically, deposits and withdrawals into other people's body budgets. We are the caretakers of other people's nervous systems. This is why, um, you know, for example, loneliness and um, social isolation reduce your lifespan 
I mean, that's not metaphorical. That's real and countable in yeah. the number of years that on probabilistically, on average, you will lose of your life. It's just like smoking. <laughs> you know, it's, you can quantify it. And you can quantify yeah. it probabilistically. You can, I can't say for you specifically, de determinant, you know, like I can, you know, say 100% this is what's going to happen to you. It's all about probabilities. That's, that's the next, that's your third book, right? It's all about probabilities, but the fact <laughs> is the research is really clear on this point. Um, so I guess my point is that some features that our brains compute really are... Um, up to us and flexible but some are not there is a boundary there and um, you know so and social reality and physical reality have this really interesting dance that they do so you know we can um, change the physical reality of a, the physical processes of, of health and illness in a person by the social categories that we trap them in. I mean, so, you know, skin color, skin tone, how much melanin you have in your skin at any given point of time is a physical reality. We overlay on top of that a social reality called race. But that social reality gets under the skin of people and causes, in, it, it, it is a body budgeting burden for many people that makes them more likely to be um, metabolically unwell. Um, and, mm -hmm. right, or, um, you know, uh, I just was reading an article. So one of the best predictors of uh, productivity in the workplace is, is um, or I, let me say it differently, there are a class of things that predict productivity in the workplace. And if you look at them, they all have to do with body budgeting. Of course, they aren't discussed that way, but they're things like, yeah, interesting. Are your employees, do they have a good life work balance? Are they getting enough sleep? Are they hydrated? Do they trust their um, team members or or their um, do they trust their uh, their managers and um, trust it turns out you know having other people be predictable to you is uh, easier on your body budget Th things that are uncertain or or um, amb ambiguous or that are not easily predictable turn out to be harder for your body budget to deal with sometimes we seek those things out um, but most of the time we, we don't. And so if you, if other people on your team are, you trust them and you get along with them uh, and um, that makes it easier for you to exchange criticisms of each other's work and, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, that turned, the, all these things turn out to be really great predictors of, of, um, of productivity. And so even companies though, that try to foster their a good life work balance for their employees their employees often don't take advantage of it they often choose to work you know extreme hours anyways because the incentive structure is that if you work mm. longer hours you get more money and um that belief which is a social reality I mean, you're working for something basically there's only so much i mean i i'm talking to you know I, I guess economists so maybe it won't make sense but at a certain point people start earning lots of money not just to for the instrumental value but to keep score you know it's like it's to keep score with how how you know how are you doing relative to other people and it's a way of keeping point you know of tallying points that's completely social totally. reality but it is affecting your biological reality in the sense that you will live a shorter life, relatively speaking, probabilistically. So the decisions that we make about social reality can affect physical reality. Um, but in general, 
you know, there is there is a margin where it is true, I think, that you find your own truth and you, um, but, uh, but it doesn't extend to everything. And I think that's the thing that people, um, that people sort of maybe don't understand. It, for some things, it doesn't really matter how strongly you feel about it. it um, you, you know, you might not care. Uh, you might not believe that speaking with casual brutality to another person makes a withdrawal from their body budget. You might not believe it. You might not care. Uh, that person might not even feel stressed. Um, all of those things could be true. Uh, but still, the withdrawal is made. And so, you need to think about the kind of person that you want to be. Who do you want to be in this world? Do you want to be somebody who, uh, and, you know, who is a burden to, on others, on, uh, you know, or do you want to be somebody uh, who um, contributes to the well-being of others? And when I say others, you have to think about what that means uh, in terms of these boundaries that you've drawn for yourself about who you are relative to who other people are. You know, um, I will tell you that I, um, I think the most patriotic thing that a person can do, and in the long run, uh, for the health of the country and the health of democracy, but also for their own health, is to talk to people who they don't agree with. Mm -hmm. and engage with that with curiosity you know i exercise every day even though i'm not particularly fond of doing it i always dread it every morning i wake up and i think i'm not going to go to my computer and sit in front of my you know email and i know i'm going to go right upstairs to my gym and i'm going to exercise and um you know and i never do uh -huh. i always you know i'm always dragging my ass up there i don't really want to do it I, you know and while i'm doing it i'm you know usually huffing and puffing and it's unpleasant and then I get done and I'm really glad that I did it. It's an investment that I'm making in my, it's a big expenditure, but it's gonna pay off. It really have dividends later on and even now actually. And so talking to people, connecting with people, finding similarity with people you might disagree with on certain identity dimensions. Uh, you, can, you can always find some, something Maybe it's just that the two of you breathe oxygen, you know? You can always find something um, that makes you mm -hmm. similar to somebody else. And then you start to realize that these, these, um, these truths that you uh, feel very, very, very strongly about are really relative. They're relative. They're all relative. That is... The key to resilience in a stressful world, but it's also the key to um, uh, a healthy democracy. Yeah, well, I think to wrap it up, and I love how you ended it. If if we could just be a little more other focused and in investing in those around us, and to flip that back, that means there's a, if that's how society worked in an idealistic way there'd be a lot of people investing back in you instead of just yourself, which is kind of that mutual caring of that a community can have as a, in its more perfect form. Absolutely. But I would say even greater, I guess the other point that I'm driving at, it's true. I mean, you have, you have a, a lot of responsibility for who you are in this world and you have also responsibility mm -hmm. for how you, for the care for really um, how you impact other people, whether you like it or not, you know, and whether you believe it or not, in the end, you know, this level of division and divisiveness in this country is costing tremendous yeah. amounts of money that could be better spent on things that would enhance humanity as a whole. But even more than exceptionalism, the problem is when everybody's body budgets are running a deficit, they have less tolerance for novelty, for uncertainty, and for complexity. And so they gravitate to simple, single causes, simple explanations with a mm. single cause and a single effect. And 
or a single savior. Or a single savior. A and person. that is the harbinger of authoritarianism, the opposite of mm -hmm. democracy. Democracy requires a certain tolerance of ambiguity, and it requires an ability to get along with people who you don't agree with and to see value potentially in what they're saying, even if you don't agree or maybe not value, but at least you can admit the fact that they have a point of view and that they're not evil for having it. It's just different from yours. And I'm not saying anything that a, a bunch of other people haven't already said um, and probably said much more cogently than I'm saying it now. I think the thing that I can add here is that there really is an underlying neural basis for maybe not in a direct one-to-one -one way, but there really is an underlying neural basis for when a country gravitates towards um, uh, authoritarianism or you know, creeps in that direction or defends democracy with little actions every day. Little actions every day are really um, what um, what defends um, the principles that the United States was founded on. Mm -hmm. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for joining. You've you've mentioned two books. Where where can folks find those? And then, if you're on social media at all, is, is there places that folks can follow more of your work on a on a more day to day? Yeah, basis? Um, I have a website. It's cleverly called LisaFeldmanBarrett.com. <laughs> it's just my name, dot com, and. It has links to my books, but also to a lot of popular articles that I've written in the New York Times and in various magazines and so on, and um, all of my podcasts and blog posts and things like that. So Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you so much for your thoughts. I am definitely going to listen to this a couple more times, and I'm sure I'll glean even more. Thank you. Oh, I should say I'm also on Twitter, and I'm on LinkedIn, and the links are in the, you know, on the web on the web. Uh, site so okay yeah. wonderful all right we'll grab okay. those thank you all right thanks okay, so much thank you welcome to the end of the video only champions live here so pat yourself on the back if you want to see more content like subscribe tag the notification bell and rate and review if you're on podcast make sure to leave a comment below of who you'd like us to interview next we read all of them we love hearing your feedback and until then we'll see you next week